Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, we're going to continue on with the three-part lecture series on animals and we're going to keep moving up the evolutionary chain by looking at the groups starting with segmentation. There are a lot of advantages to segmentation. It's advantageous during development because there's greater efficiency obtained by constructing a whole organism out of identical modules. In the adult, locomotor activity is enhanced because of the independent nature of each segment and the flexibility afforded by a series of segmented parts. Segmentation also gives these phyla a survival advantage. Since many segments are similar to the other segments in form and function, damage to one of or several segments does not necessarily mean that the entire body will shut down. So the first group that has the segments themselves are the segmented worms, the annelids. Annelids have today the most segments of any organism on the planet. Nearly all of the segments have clusters of bristles called seedy that allow traction for crawling or burrowing. And this is the first group also to have a true body cavity. So they have two big evolutionary developments um, in this group. The digestive system is complete and the circulation is closed, which means that the blood is confined to hearts and blood vessels, and this is also the first in this group as well. The outer body surface is still covered with a layer called the cuticle, just like in the flatworms and the roundworms, and the inner body has a partition that creates a hydrostatic skeleton so that the muscles have something to push on. The nervous system has a mini brain called a ganglion in each segment so that they can respond to their environment more efficiently. And the excretory system of these organisms has pores on almost all of the segments for ease in ridding of waste. Two of the groups of annelids that are classified by how many CD they have. They are generally the earthworms and their related kin and the marine polychaete worms such as bristle worms. Both groups are generally non-parasitic and are either carnivores or detritivores, which means that they, if they're detritivores, they eat detritus, or basically they kind of act like decomposers without being bacteria or fungi. The other group of annelids is the leeches, which are parasitic, they're bloodsuckers. Leeches are making a comeback, however, in medicine and are used to treat chronic diseases and help in appendage reattachment surgery. So if you take a look here, the first one on the left is the giant New Zealand earthworm. They can get up to six feet long. The polychaete bristle worm up on the upper right and the leech that is pulling out swelling from this man's inflamed eye. The next group are the mollusks. The mollusks are very, very diverse. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, but all of them have a fleshy, soft body with true body cavities. All mollusks have a layer called the mantle, and it's a skirt-like tissue piece that covers the body, and sometimes um, they're inside a shell and sometimes they're not. Some mollusks have a head with eyes and tentacles, and some have a shell. Some also have a tongue-like organ called a radula, which helps to rasp at food. Chitons are protected by eight plates that cover their soft bodies. And chiton is actually the name for Greek armor because it was uh, plated like this. Bivalves will use their shells for protection, but can also burrow into the sand or jet away using water through their siphons. Nudibranchs secrete toxins to make them taste bad if a predator tries to eat them, and that's also why they're brightly colored as a warning coloration. And finally, gastropods can undergo a process called torsion, where their entire bodies twist so that they fit inside their shell, and the shell can then close up to protect the animal. So mollusks have a wide array of adaptations, but my most favorite mollusks are the cephalopods. Um, the body of a squid is highly modified for a very active predatory lifestyle. All cephalopods have arms, but almost all squid also have two hunting tentacles, 
and they all have beak-like jaws that they use for biting into prey. All of the cephalopods move by jet propulsion. They contract their mantle and force water through the siphons, and they can go quite fast. Some squid can reach up to 40 kilometers per hour, about 25 miles per hour. And these are also the smartest and fastest of all the invertebrates. Uh, cephalopods show, especially the octopi, have shown not only problem-solving ability, but they've also found an ability to work as cooperative hunters with other species like eels. It's been very interesting looking at this group. And my favorite of all is the one that's there on the bottom, and that is Vampyrotuthus infernalis. He's a deep-sea squid, nicknamed Dumbo because he's got big ears that he swims around with. Um, but you can see the spikes on the inside of his arms, um, which are in a web. And those spikes are basically there for protection because um, if you annoy him, he flips those arms up over his head and he becomes basically a spiky football and about the same size. But I like him because his name means a vampire squid from hell. Okay, so moving on to the next big group, and it's a big group, and that's the arthropods. These are the most successful animal group on the planet. They have the most species, produce the greatest number of offspring, occupy the greatest variety of habitats, have some of the most effective defenses known to the planet, and are best able to exploit new resources. They have a lot of reasons for their success. They have a hardened exoskeleton that is made of protein, a protein called chitin, and that's flexible, lightweight, and yet protective. It's a barrier to water loss and can support its body mass in air. Exoskeletons, however, do restrict growth, so they have to be shed periodically in a process called molting. Arthropods are named for their jointed appendages. Arthro means joint and pod means foot. The jointed appendages are joined at membranous areas where the body parts touch. The appendages can become specialized for feeding, sensory structures, locomotion, sperm transfer, and spinning silk. Some of the specialized structures um, are formed by segments fusing to form, perform certain functions better. The respiratory structures are consistent of special tubes that deliver oxygen directly to the body tissues, and so this allows for high metabolic rates and sustained energetic activities such as flight. So this is the first time you've really had uh, a lot of really fast, really agile, really mobile organisms. It's also the first group of organisms that moved onto land. They have compound eyes, which are an example of a specialized sense, which composed of many small units that allowed a wide angle of vision with the ability to detect very small movements in their environment. And finally, metamorphosis, which transforms an individual from an egg through specific stages to an adult. This primarily prevents competition between the young and the adults. Larval stages focus on feeding and growth, and adults focus on dispersal and reproduction. So let's talk about the main groups. The trilobites were the first, and all of the trilobites are extinct. They, went, they lived from about 440 to 420 million years ago, and uh, they form an ideal uh, fossil in, in, uh, index fossil, which means that they lived for a short period of time, but they were everywhere. And so when you find them, you know that the layer is about 420 to 440 million years old. Trilobites were one of the first hard-shelled creatures to be preserved as fossils. Chelicerates include horseshoe crabs, Arachnids, like spiders, scorpions, mites, and ticks. Chelicerates all have eight legs, plus a pair of chelicerae to pierce prey and a pair of pedipalps to help manipulate the food or transfer sperm. They have specialized respiratory structures called book lungs or book gills, depending on whether they live um, terrestrially or aquatically. Crustaceans got their name from their crusty exoskeleton. Most crustaceans form major parts of the food webs. The crustacean body is divided into many segments, 
and they have to repeatedly molt their exoskeletons in order to grow. You can always recognize a crustacean because it has two pairs of antennae. It also has a pair of mandibles and five pairs of legs. So they're also called decapods. The myriapods means that they have many legs, and these, these include the centipedes and the millipedes. The largest group, though, is the insects. Insects have, very, have three very distinct regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Their great success is due to their ability to exploit nature's resources during different stages of metamorphosis, production of huge numbers of offspring, and the ability to disperse by flight. Um, one, one time Darwin was asked, what do you think God favors most? And he replied, the beetle. Um, which you see a picture of a beetle up on the upper left-hand side that's a, a large Japanese stag beetle. Um, he said, because if you look at the number of species, there's over 300,000 species of just beetle alone. So that should give you an idea of what he was thinking. Echinoderms are the last group we're really going to talk about that's not a chordate. And they're kind of the most advanced non-chordate invertebrate. Um, echinoderms me means spiny skin. Echino means spiny, derm means skin. And their skins are spiny because the spines are made of calcium carbonate, which is the same stuff as in chalk. The echinoderms include sea stars, sea urchins, brittle stars, and sea cucumbers. All the adults are radially symmetrical, so we've kind of gone backwards from the uh, cephalization uh, progress that we saw all the way up through the arthropods. However, the larvae are bilaterally symmetrical. There is no brain in these guys. The nervous system is also dispersed throughout the body. But they have a really interesting feature called the water vascular system. And it's attached to tube feet, which allows them to move and capture prey. And if you want to get an idea of what that actually does, uh, if you have to open an oyster, for example, the oyster has a muscle that holds its shell closed. It has a couple of muscles that do that. But your whole job to open that oyster is you have to slip a knife between the two shells and slice through that muscle in order to get it open. Well, echinoderms, starfish, they love oysters and mussels and other bivalves. Um, they don't have a knife, obviously. They don't have a brain, so they couldn't figure out how to use one if they got one. But they do have those tube feet. And when you have several thousand tube feet pulling on a water system, they can rip open that oyster faster than you can cut the muscles. Um, they're very, very, very powerful when they're all working together like that. Finally, we're going to move on to the chordates and introduce them before we go into the vertebrates. Chordates have these, these characteristic at some point in their life cycle, and you are a chordate as well, so you have these two at, at points in your development. All of them have a notochord, which is a long rod of stiffened tissue that supports the body. In vertebrates, this will change into the backbone. All chordates have a dorsal tubular nerve cord that lies above the nordic cord and gut and this becomes the spinal cord in vertebrates and in vertebrates it also becomes encased in the spine all chordates have a pharynx with gill slits found at the beginning of the gut so yeah you had those too when you were developing as an embryo and they also had a tail that is found posterior to the anus and yep you had one too. You didn't look anything different than a fish or a salamander when you were very, very early in your development. And the tail is the last thing to be lost or changed from the chordate, early chordate plan as we developed. So there are still occasionally some babies that are born with a post-anal uh, tail still attached. It's usually quite short and gets removed right at the beginning of birth. But not all chordates are vertebrates, but all vertebrates are chordates. And the majority of chordates are. But we're going to look at the invertebrate chordates. 
Uh, if you'll remember last time uh, in the last lecture, I said that all animals don't have cell walls except for one. Well, here's the one on the left-hand side. These are the tunicates, or sea squirts. These are marine organisms that have a jelly-like tunic. The larval stages are mo modal, which means they can swim around. They have the notochord and the tail. But the adult stage is sessile, which means it doesn't move, and it filter feeds using its pharyngeal gill slits as its uh, filter. One interesting thing about tunicates, um, one of those weird factoids that you pick up as you go along in your life, is that uh, the male tunicate's penis is five times its own body length. And it kind of, you know, sits there coiled up, ready to go. Pretty much when they land from the larval form to the adult form and they start to develop as the adult, they kick out their brain, they kick out everything but their digestive organs and their uh, reproductive organs, and that's pretty much all they do after that point. And they're called sea squirts because when you pull them up, uh, if they're attached to a rock or something, and you pull them up out of the sea, they squirt water out through the operculum up at the top. The lancelets are the other invertebrate chordates, and they kind of look fish-like. They're pretty small, though. They, they're only a couple millimeters long, and they burrow their tails in the sand, and they kind of stick that mouth part out. Um, and the mouth part, they filter feed through it. They have a closed circulatory system, but their oxygen is still diffused across their body wall. And they show all four chordate characteristics throughout their entire lives, so as larvae and as adults. So that closes our invertebrate chordates. Those are the only two. And we will move on into the vertebrates at the next lecture. Have a great day.